Russ, I apologize. I had you muted. You, I have fixed it. Mute. There you go. Can we hear me now? Okay, thumbs up. All right, why isn't my video up or my... There we go. Let's do this. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Thumbs up. Hopefully we're gonna learn something today. Um, we do things a little differently on our farm and um, I wanna share that knowledge with you. I have some videos for you. Being it, we can't be out on the pasture and, and see what we're, we're doing. Before we go into uh, a formal introduction here, um, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the slang or some of the term terminology that we use when we're talking about uh, grazing or rotational grazing or mob grazing, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, one stock density. Stock density is how many pounds of animal you put onto an acre in a 24 hour period. Uh, two stockpiled forages is forages that have uh, went into their dormant state. It's just grass or whatever corn, whatever's sitting out there in the field waiting to be harvested. Um, I can't think of any off, any other thing right off the top of my head here. Um, I'm going to, if you think of, if there's something that I'm not, uh, if you're not fully understanding, you know, don't be afraid to type in the chat pod and let Selena know and she'll interrupt me and, and we'll cover it. Those are warm season grass fields that we've grazed. It's a time lapse. This is over an hour and a half period. This is the second one, the second time lapse that we did. Um, okay, let's get into it. We're gonna talk about rotational grazing in action. And I'm gonna be sharing some of the things that we do on the farm. We only have two hours today and quite frankly this is uh, something that we could talk about for weeks and but I'm going to give you the basics and maybe you can apply the principles. I own Wilson Land and Cattle Company. I have 220 acres, 130 acres of its pasture field and I have a lease farm up the the road for me and uh, it's only 15 acres. We have uh, cattle, equine, and we do some custom grazing when it's possible. Sometimes it's hard to get uh, animals to do custom grazing with, uh, but that is a very good way of making extra money. And you don't have the uh, money invested when you're doing custom grazing. We're using extensive adaptive grazing management. Uh, we keep the livestock out on the pasture for more than 300 days a year and we're going to go through that. I believe I have a seven-year average. We're using a lot of innovation on the farm to make us so we're able to reduce the inputs and the time spent out on the farm. We're going to talk about goals today. We need to set goals on the farm. You need to set those goals a little bit higher, a little bit out of reach, so you have something to work towards. You need to keep things simple. Simple is always better as human beings. We always overthink things. Um, and sometimes I even have to step back and, and look and, and say, you know, you're way overthinking this. And we need to one of the things that we do is if we have to do anything on the farm, we, we try to do it with our livestock. With the livestock, it's always simpler, it takes less time, and it's a lot easier. We've got a plan, um, and whenever we do 
we got an echo here, Selena, a little bit. No, okay, we're good. Um, we have to plan. We need plans for on the farm. I know we're in a, uh, a lot of the state of Pennsylvania is in a drought state, and we need to have a, a drought plan, a wet weather plan, a cold weather plan, and a hot weather plan at the minimum. So we don't wait until we go into a drought state to figure out, well, we need to figure out what we're going to do. You can just pull that drought plan out and take a look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is what, what we planned. Um, you know, in times of stress, we seem to think, seem to forget a lot of things. So, you know, having those plans are very useful and, you know, jot down, it doesn't have to be anything fancy and just jot notes down on a piece of paper and you have those and you can refresh your memory. And we need to keep good records. You don't know where you're going and unless you know where you've been and low stress. We need to keep everything low stress uh, for the livestock as well as ourselves. It's no fun to have a stressful situation all the time. Um, Russ, we have our first question before you move on. Okay. What is customized grazing? Custom grazing is where um, somebody has a group of animals that they need grazed. They don't have the pasture for them and you just bring them to your farm and they pay you. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of getting paid to, to custom graze. The way I did it is I charged them so much to take care of each animal every day. If they wanted minerals in with them, they had to supply the minerals. Um, and what I would do, I'd charge them so much to take care of the animal. And then depending on the size of the animal, I would uh, break that down on how much forage they would uh, require and charge them X amount of dollars for the amount of forage that they'd be consuming. You know, like a 200 pound animal, he's not gonna, uh, need as much forage as a 1200 pound animal. So you just can't charge a flat rate the whole way across the board. Um, so that's custom grazing. And it's, it's very, very profitable. If you haven't done it and you have the opportunity, you don't have the overhead and the investment of the animals doing it. So it is a great way if you're just getting started into grazing, if you can find somebody um, to get you animals to graze for them. And usually you only have them through the summer months and you know they're there and gone and you don't have to worry about them. Great, thank you. And we work off of principles. My farm, you know, I'm in northwestern Pennsylvania, Forest County, and um, we work off of principles from all over the world. You know, just because I hear this all the time and, you know, that works in Northwestern Pennsylvania, but it won't work in Southeastern Pennsylvania. That's not necessarily true. We just need to apply the basic principles. This here's my farm. Um, this is my soil types. I have about 40% of my farm is wetland soil kind of across here. I'm going to draw a lot of pictures today. It's going to slow things down, but I think it's um, very, very useful. Okay, this area here is pretty dry. I can graze that in just about any type of weather. Nice. I'm going to make a circle. This here's the wetland soil that I have on the farm. And I have to be do planning, wet weather planning. I'll reserve these fields for whenever it's drier and we'll graze them then. Um, so, you know, we know as you work on your farm and, and you know by getting your animals out there, you know where you can be and when you can be there. Okay. You have to forgive me here. This is the third time that I've done Zoom, so I'm trying to get to my next slide. There we go. 
Okay, this here's my home. This here's my home farm here, and then this here's a farm. My farm split in half by a road. Um, this here's the farm across the road from me, and you can see there's a lot of infrastructure there. On the far home farm, we have perimeter fence around all the fields, and then we have it broke down into with interior fencing. If I had to do it all over, we wouldn't have any interior fencing on the farm. We're going to go in more, more in depth in, on that here in a minute. And you can see there's a lot of water. We have about 12,000 feet of water line buried and above ground. Each one of, at, at, each one of these uh, little points here are hydrants, frost-free hydrants we have buried. And we're going to go into how we graze through the winter time and not freeze up. We don't have any fixed watering point points for say other than the frost-free hydrants. I believe that we need to keep our water portable. It helps aids with the nutrient recycling. And then this here's my farm on the west side. This section here is all above ground water line with Plawson uh, quick connect hookups. And then I have a little bit of above ground down in here, but the rest is all buried water line. And we have these, these fields broke down like the other ones with the interior fencing. And the little bars in the way, there we go. I have this field split in half right now with the temporary fencing. And the cattle are right here today. And the reason we have that split down, we want to have better pasture utilization. If we were, that's, a, it's, it's kind of a rectangular shaped paddock, but if we were to graze this field the whole way across, this, the paddocks would be long and narrow, and we wouldn't be able to utilize the pastures quite as well with, with the livestock. So I try to keep my paddocks as square as possible. This field here has approximately 100 days of rest on it, um, which seems to be for the last three or four years, 100 days of rest on the farm has been working out really good with us. We need to rest our plants. Those plants need to be able to express themselves. If we come in on, on any particular field and regraze them in you know, 25 to 45 days, there's a good chance that we're gonna stress those plants and reduce the overall, overall production. This here's my lease farm. I don't have a lot of infrastructure here. Um, the green area around, that is a perimeter fence. I have no water. I use water totes. I haul water to the cow, cows. It's a mile and a half up the road when it's time to move the cows up the road. Uh -oh. There we go. When it's time to move the cows up the road, my farm is up the road this way a mile and a half. I'll set fence both sides of the road. And we'll bring them in and down in the gate right into here. And setting fence, once you learn how to set fence, it doesn't take long. We can, there's two of us setting fence usually and tearing out. We can set the fence, move the cows, tear out in under three hours. So it takes a lot less than putting them on a trailer, stressing the livestock, putting them on a trailer, hauling them down here, and then have to reload them and, and bring them back. But whenever we come into this uh, farm, the first thing we do is fence the woods up. There's nothing in there for them to eat and they don't need to be in there. So, and then this woods actually has a little bit of a stream going down through the center of it and then it goes underground right about here. So we don't need to worry about it. And then it comes back out right in here. So we'll fence this area here out as well. 
when we come in here, we may graze this. We haven't grazed this uh, farm. We've had this. This is the third year that we've been on this farm, and we've grazed it twice. Usually, we only go there once a year. And the first year, our cow herd, we had seventy days or seven days of grazing. Last year, we had fourteen. This year, I expect to get twenty-one days out of it. And whenever we come to this farm, we don't graze the same way any given time. Uh, the first year we come in here, we graze like this. The second year we come in, we split this down. And then we made our paddock square. And this year there's going to be a lot of dead material or a lot of lignified material. So what we're going to do is when we come in here, we're going to graze it long ways, long and skinny. Those paddocks will probably only be about 35 feet apart. We'll move them four times a day in there, 70, approximately 70, 75 animal units. Russ, can you tell us what kind of fence you're putting in? Uh, for the perimeter fence is uh, on this farm here, it's four strand high tensile fence, wooden fence posts. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you could use for exterior fencing. You could use T posts, which would be a little bit less money. Um, and there's some plastic posts out there. Timeless Fence makes a, a plastic, plastic fence post is uh, guaranteed, I believe, for 50 years. So if you put that fence post in, it will last for a really long time. And then my interior fencing is braided um, temporary fencing. Uh, it has six stainless steel wires in it, and then it has three tin copper wires in it. And there's a lot of different companies that make the good the good temporary fencing, that, that's probably the most conduct, conductive fence for your temporary fencing that you can get. I want those cows to get shocked or the sheep or whatever is in there. I don't want them to be going through the fence. Uh, the interior fencing that's just uh, rope or twine, it's not quite as good. There's guys that are, are successful with it, but we've been doing this for seven or eight years now, and we haven't replaced any of our wire, any of the braided wire. And all the twine has actually, the sun has eaten it up and it's, it's gone away. It's, we don't use twine any longer. Is your exterior fence also electrified or yes. just? Electrified? Yes, the exterior fence is electrified. And let's say we come in here and we, oh, let me get that back. Having troubles getting my, there it is, okay. No worries. Yep, so you just have to be patient with me here. I'm just a farmer, so this technology. You're doing great. So um, if we come in here and we graze this, and I have a, um, I actually come in and I put a, an electric wire across to this gentleman's barn and put three ground rods in with a, a 110 fencer. This could be powered with a, a solar fencer. There's a lot of really good solar fencers out there in the market. And then it actually connects onto my exterior fence right in here someplace. But that will make that entire exterior fence hot. And then when I run my temporary fences, I can hook on to the, the exterior fence with a, an alligator clip jumper. You know, at either end, it doesn't matter. So. Let's see, here we go. We need to clear that. This is what we've had. This is what we had um, back in 2009, 2010. You can see there's a lot of problems with this, a lot of environmental problems. Um, my. Ooh. My spring is down in here in the woods. It's about a thousand feet away from my barn. I had a fly on my camera. <laughs> but all this here, you know, that's, there's going to be a lot of runoff. All that manure is going to be going down into the spring. We need to catch that manure before it gets to the spring. So here's a feed wagon, the first of June. Usually we'd start cutting a load of grass every day for the cows because you can see this pasture field. It's pretty much nothing in there. 
You can see all my soil nutrients just concentrated right here. No way to scrape them up, take them out onto the field. Bare, dry soil, unproductive. So there was a lot of problems that we had and we've done away with them. You won't find bare, bare ground on my farm at all. It, it's, it's very annoying to me. Very, very annoying. You can see here, we used to feed a lot of grain to the cows. We're 100% uh, grass fed now. The cows that we had, they could not do it without extra inputs. And these inputs are extremely expensive. This cow here, or this calf here had pink eye. We had a dairy cow we milked. We had some Herefords mixed into the herd. Those are all pretty big cows, a lot of them. This cow here is actually a frame score of seven. She weighed 1,927 pounds when we took her to the sale barn. That cow is way too big. She has to consume too many nutrients in order to maintain her body versus the calf that she's going to be weaning. Made a lot of hay. We made over 700 uh, rat baleage at peak of haymaking and we grew a lot of corn and we still grow corn from time to time we don't have any corn planted this year we didn't even plant a seed this year to be be exact but this corn field here on this year that we this corn is the best corn we ever had i had a fill of making hay and i went in and i, I told my wife i says we need to sell the corn picker she says well okay get me a picture and she put it on the internet and we got it sold pretty quickly. And then she didn't ask any questions. And about a week or so after the corn picker left, she asked, she says, well, how are we gonna harvest our corn? I said, well, those cows are more than capable, capable of doing it. So that's how we harvested the corn that year. On a lot of farms, we're putting a lot of inputs, you know, making a lot of hay, feeding a lot of grain, you know, and I'm not trying to, um, you know, if that's working on your farm, that that's great, but um, it's very, very costly and it narrows your profit margin considerably. And if you're feeding a lot of grain, feeding a lot of hay, uh, you know, your cow's the manager. You need to take your farm back over and be the manager. We have 100, uh, in my area, approximately 180 days of grass growing season. So what are we going to do for the next 185 days? We need to stockpile as much forage as, as possible. And you can see in 2012 is when we really I geared things up. Uh, 2011 is when we started rotational grazing in the fall. It took my wife and I an hour and a half a day to move the cows one time. And it was very, very overwhelming. So if you're starting, you know, don't give up. Stick with it. You can do it. Um, I, I encourage you. And in 2000, I believe it was 2012, we're going to look at the numbers here coming up. But uh, when we started moving the cows, when I committed to moving the cows four times a day, I really was overwhelmed. Yeah, it was... Okay, 2000, yeah, 2013, and actually 2014 was the uh, year that we really kicked it up a notch. I, le I read a lot of research papers. Um, this is what's, this here is one of the things that led me to do what I'm doing on the farm. Uh, you know, our stored feed costs approximately 252% of our operational inputs. And as a business and a small farm, we cannot let 52% of our costs go out the window. We need to treat the farm as a business. So we need to try and reduce those stored feed costs as much as possible. I'm not making hay. I buy all my hay. I buy all my hay. And, and it's actually cheaper for me to buy the hay than it is to make it. It cost me approximately 90 to hundred dollars a ton to purchase hay. And it was costing me $136 a ton 
to make the hay. So it doesn't make any sense for me to be out there making hay. And now I could make very, very good hay. I can make dairy quality hay, but you know, you need to be honest with your cat self. Gestational beef cattle do not need dairy quality hay. Now, if you're finishing stalkers, I, you could maybe justify a little bit, but um, for the most part, I feed the lowest plane of nutritional possible on the farm. And then of course our depreciation costs, our equipment. The cost of our hay making equipment, just the round baler and the tractor to run the round baler cost more than what it costs to put the fence and the water lines in. So that's just something for you to think about. And this here leads back to good record keeping. Um, you can see in 2011, we had 120 grazing days. We were on a rotation. I thought I was rotationally grazing at 7 to 14 day rotations. And we were at peak on the farm. Our farm could not support any more than 45 animal units. And that was max. I could not squeeze any more forage out of the farm. 2013 we went to one time a day or yeah 2013 we went to one time a day rotation we went to 212 grazing days and that was relatively easy so russ just to clarify you're saying that you you got more grazing days that year and you added more animal units that's correct that's correct the animal impact onto the soil um, makes a huge amount of difference. It's, it's huge, it's night and day. You can almost immediately see from going from a seven to 14 day rotation to one time a day rotation, you can almost see results immediately. But if you really wanna see results, Start moving your livestock four times a day. Now that is very overwhelming. When you first start, when I first started rotating the cows four times a day, I'm like, what the heck did I commit myself to? Um, I stuck with it. I wasn't gonna give up. And now I can, I'm efficient enough to, to move those cows from the time I leave the house to the time I get back, I can move the cows, keep water in every paddock that they go into, portable water, and come back to the house. And that includes setting and tearing fence out. I can do all that in an hour and a half a day. And I'm not by any means breaking my neck to do that. If I wanted to be fast, I can do it a lot faster than that. Um, but for the most part, I take my time and, and do a good job. Now, in 2015, we had 110 animal units, but we only had 267 grazing days. So I needed to adjust the stocking rate on the farm. In 2016, we had 294 grazing days. And this here goes back to our goals on the farm. My goal on the farm, whenever I first started rotational grazing, is to keep the livestock out on the land for 300 grazing days. And it didn't dawn on me until 2016, I really screwed that goal up. I could just never, that 300 grazing days was just out of reach. In 2016, I set my goal to 365 grazing days. And in 2017, we finally met that. But one of the interesting things here, we went from a two to time, nine times a day rotation we doubled the carrying capacity on the farm and we took the fertilizer and lime out of the grazing system. We stopped putting fertilizer on the farm back in 2012, 2013. We stopped using fertilizer and lime on the farm. So then we took all that out and we, here, I'll just show you the next slide. In 2011, we had 45 animal units. We purchased 3,500 gallons of diesel fuel. We had $2,400 in plastic wrap, $26,000 in fertilizer. 
and this year kind of got stuck together somehow. In 2016, we had 294 grazing days. We rotated the livestock two to nine times a day, and we doubled the carrying capacity on the farm, and we only purchased 200 gallons of diesel fuel. Ross, if this is a good time, we have a couple questions. Sure, yep. Great. Um, so, Somebody wants to know what your average paddock size would be. Oh, that's going to change throughout the year. Um, it depends, you know, in the spring of the year, you're going to move the cows across the farm quicker. Uh, we need to give adequate rest. We don't want to overgraze those plants. When we first go into a paddock, we don't want to start grazing those, those plants until we have a, the plants are at least in a three or four leaf stage. And that's for orchard grass or fescue. And we don't want to take more than half, half of those plants um, whenever we're grazing. If we take more than half those plants, we're going to slow the overall growth down. And um, so in the spring of the year, we may be covering three or four acres a day, maybe even five or six, seven acres a day. And we'll move them multiple times across. In the spring of the year, we move them more so because it's wet and we want to try to keep those paddocks as square as possible, reduce compaction onto the soil. And whenever the grasses say mid-June, mid-June or, um, darn fly likes my camera, um, in mid-June we'll actually slow them down. We only move, might only move the cows a quarter of an acre a day. So that, you know, it's variant upon how much forage you have in the pasture at any given time. Okay, you have another question there, Selena? Yeah, so um, basically asking why it's important to move those cows four times a day. And you kind of hinted at like the compaction. Okay, there's, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Okay. First and foremost, and I'm gonna show some pictures um, if you have that coming up, that's okay. Yeah, I, thought, yeah, I have, I I have I that coming. That. Yes, I have that coming up. Um, but I will, will hint the reason for moving, you know, I will give some hints because it isn't bad to say things twice. Um, you know, we're, we're able to retain that information. Soil nutrient recycling. We need to have, we need to build rest into our system. We need to rest those plants as much as possible because when we go in and graze, we're causing stress upon those plants and they need to be able to fully recover in order to be productive. So, um, and if I don't fully cover that later on here, um, you know, feel free to ask that question again. Great. And then we have one more, uh, let us know if you get to it, if you're going to get to it later, but uh, asking about how many feet of permanent fence you have on your farm compared to how many feet of temporary fence. Oh, I'm not sure how much interior fencing I have. Um, I'm at the point now where I'm going to start tearing interior fencing out because temporary fencing is a lot more flexible and I can do a better job in my soil and nutrient recycling. Uh, my perimeter fence is around 16 to 18,000 feet. And then I have, you know, 42 paddocks probably. I don't know exactly how many there are. Um, and then we'll break those down into smaller paddocks. And this year with having so much forage on the farm, I figured we were gonna be low in forage with having so much forage on the farm, we've actually started and I showed in, on that one beginning slide where the cows are today, we've actually used, started using temporary fencing to split those fields down even further. And it, it really doesn't make any sense to Put a temp or put an interior fence there because the next time we go through, we may not, you know, we're going to graze that a little bit different. And if we put a, a temporary fence there, it is going to uh, maybe reduce our flexibility some. So, um, whenever we're grazing our fields, you know, we think that we're taking a lot of nutrients out of the soil. If we look at, let's look at the dark green here. If we produce 250 pounds of beef, which is pretty close to consuming four tons of dry matter yield. So whenever we produce 250 pounds of beef, we're gonna 
take approximately nine pounds of nitrogen. And one of those cows do the soil nutrient recycling. Whenever they pee, pee or um, put the manure back out onto the soil, most all that nitrogen is uh, back into the soil right where it needs to be. You're only going to take approximately four and a half pounds of phosphorus and you know 0.7 pounds of potassium. And if you look at the soil tests on my farm, you know they're telling me I need 300 pounds of phosphorus. I need 750 pounds of potassium. Um, I haven't found that to hinder my ability to make a whole bunch of forage on the soil. But if we look here, if we make the hay off of there, we're going to take 200 pounds of nitrogen, 40 pounds of phosphorus, and 160 pounds of potassium. And if we make that hay, we need to make sure those nutrients get back on the soil where they are removed from, or we have to think about putting some sort of fertilizer onto the soil. We're going to talk about uh, plant growth here a little bit. You know, your plants, the, the whole point of this whole slide is, you know, if we take too much of our, our plants off there, our plants must for, first feed itself before it can feed livestock. And I'm referring to our underground livestock as well as our above ground livestock. The underground livestock actually outweigh our above ground livestock. And we have those partnerships with the plants and our, you know, our microbes that are below ground that help keep those plants healthy. So we need to feed the plants, the underground uh, livestock before we can feed the above ground livestock in order to be at maximum production. This here was a turning point for me. This field here is a fescue field. And um, let me see, here we go. This is a fescue field and we're coming across this field. It was approximately the 4th of July and fescue by the 4th of July is pretty rank nasty. The cows don't want it, but we were grazing as much as we could. We were grazing as much as we could and, oh, back. And we could only get the stubble height down to approximately eight inches. So I moved the cows off to there because they were giving me a lot of rejection. And this, I came in and I made the hay on this side the same day that I moved the cows off. I cut it, stubble height five inches, stubble height here was eight inches, but I come back in 10 days and we had seven inches of regrowth versus three inches of regrowth. And you could actually see where I made hay and where I grazed for two years to come. So there was, you know, a lot of things that went on there. Cleared all drawings. So, you know, I think maybe this here's a good spot to take a break, Selena. Uh, yeah. We're going to take a break um, and then we'll start in. We'll start in. I'm going to, we'll take a break for like five minutes. Folks can go to the bathroom, get coffee, and then um, I'll answer a few questions. Sure. That would be great. Um, okay. Going to just leave everybody muted just to keep it simple. Um, go ahead and take a quick break. We'll come back. Um, so I have 1047. So we'll come back, um, you know, just before 1055. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, send them in the chat. Thanks, everybody's doing great. Okay, so it says slightly off topic, oh. um, but probably a great question because it's very relevant. Okay. Did you work a side job during your conventional model and do you still? I have never worked a side job. Whenever I started farming, I went full time. Um, and we, when we first start, well, I can't say that when I first started farming, I had, a, a metal fabrication business mm -hmm. as well as I shoed horses. I had 350 head of horses that I attended to every six to eight weeks uh, when I, whenever I first started. Uh, so I, I had a full plate. I had two employees working in the metal fab shop and I did it, went out and did the horseshoe and on my own and it just got to be too much you know working 100 hours a week just is not an option for anybody yeah. it's going to make a person an old person really quick um 
So whenever we, whenever I committed to making the farm a prof, profitable, healthy, low stress business is when things started to change. Well, that's great to hear. I know there's a lot of people that have can, to have that side job. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of folks that do and, and I completely understand, but you know, even if you do have that side job, you know, you can still, if you get, if you learn how to set fence or whatever, um, you know, you can still increase your overall carrying capacity on your farm and, and make it profitable. You know, you don't have to have a hundred cows to, to be profitable, two or three cows, you know, you can still make money and, and work a side job. Um, you know, it's in, some of you know I have a um on Facebook. I do a lot of short videos on Facebook and I also have a YouTube channel. And you know, you can look me up there if you have any questions or any videos like setting fence. I've been getting a lot of questions on how to be efficient setting fence. And I'm gonna do some YouTube videos and maybe some more Facebook videos to to maybe help help with that. Um, you know, you you know, just seeing somebody else do it a different way, you might be able to pick some things up that, you know, can make make things a lot more efficient for you. And I've done a lot of videos on portable water. Uh, I have mastered portable water and I like to share that with uh, folks because, you know, we're, we're water and I've watered up to 110 animal units out of a 55 gallon Rubbermaid tub filled to uh, 10 gallons and moved it and kept it in with the livestock. And uh, I'm pretty excited to show you uh, my latest invention as far as a water tub goes here. I think I have approximately maybe, there's no more than $25 invested into it with the valve. Um, and it's like super streamlined and light and easy and portable. And it's just the greatest thing ever. Excellent. That's great. I think we're in good shape to, to keep keep, moving on. Keep, keep moving. Okay. Yeah, it looks um, like we have everyone back. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'm going to kind of buzz through some of these slides because towards the end of the presentation, I have the innovation part. And I think that is more important to a lot of folks, you know, to help get them to the point where they can, can graze. But, you know, this, this here is important as well, you know. I tell folks it takes grass to make grass. If we go out there and graze that off, we go out and graze our pastures down to two inches, you know, we don't have grass. And, you know, you can see here, we're tramping a lot. Um, I get, you know, you're wasting a lot. Uh, no, we're not wasting a thing. Um, it's there and it will be recycled back into the soil in the little 21 days. And if it's not, it's there for the livestock to next go through. Um, so, you know, we're not wasting anything. And actually, if you overgraze that and take it down to two inches, you're actually wasting more. And that wastage mainly is water because that water is going to evaporate out of the soil quicker. And it's also going to cause compaction and that compaction will cause a lot of uh, water runoff. I want to be able to capture as much water as possible whenever uh, we have a rainfall event. We have some rain coming this weekend, hopefully. But um, uh, I'll get this figured out yet. That I think the drawings help considerably, so. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to, when you take half, leave half, you know, you need to consider that plant is denser to base. Um, you know, so if we graze orchard grass, it's 18 inches tall. You may take the 12, you know, take the top 12 inches and leave the rest, you know, for, so the plant is baser, is denser to base. And this here is a deal breaker for me. Um, this is why I strongly recommend, and I know there's other folks that say different things and it's different throughout the year, but for the most part, it is, the same 
I want my roots to be alive and living and growing. And if we graze it too short, we're gonna trim those roots back. We're gonna trim those roots back. And whenever we have a drought, which plant is gonna take up more water? This one or this one? So in a drought state, I need to have them roots as deep as possible. I'm rebuilding my spring uh, because of roots actually uh, right now. And I dig down, it's dry, it's powder dry four feet down. So, you know, these plants here basically go dormant or they die. And I've had reports where actually the cows are actually at these shorter pastures, they're actually ripping the plants out by the roots because it's so dry and okay. This here's the same slide, just just a different way of looking at it. As human beings, we look at things differently, all of us. But, but we knew in 1955 that this here was happening. I'm not sure why, um, you know, and I, I've done my, sh I showed you my, my overgrazing. It was terrible. Um, I'm not sure why that we come to the concept that we need to, to graze so short. Here's a chicory root that's uh, 36 inches down and as little as six months. That chicory roots followed an, uh, a nightcrawler channel. And you know, here's fescue roots. You could see roots a whole way down in this soil pit. High stock density grazing. I don't necessarily like to use that term on my farm. I like to use it as adaptive grazing because sometimes we'll graze at 50,000 pounds and we may go as high as 800,000 pounds to the acre. It just depends. But the high stock density grazing, you're gonna have a smaller amount of living dis disturbance. You're gonna have faster soil nutrient recycling, which in um, the type of farming that we're doing now that we're not applying fertilizer and we're not applying lime and, and those extra amendments, we need to recycle those nutrients back into the soil as quickly as possible. And by doing that, um, the high stock density grazing uh, helps distribute those nutrients. You're gonna re reduce the amount of erosion. You know, I'm a little bit selfish with my soil. I'm not willing to share it with the guys down there in Mississippi or I'm in the Mississippi watershed. I'm not willing to share my soil with those guys. So I wanna keep it on the farm. You know, we're going to have less time caring for our livestock. On average, throughout the entire year, it takes me less than two hours a day to care for all my livestock. Now, and that's out in a, uh, when we're grazing stockpile forages, we rotate most generally, it's twice a day, depends on how wet the soils are, we may go as high as four times a day. Um, now we have to strip graze because of uh, water freezing. But if we can keep, we all know if we keep the livestock out on the land, they're gonna be healthier. When you're on a first name basis with your veterinarian, that's probably not a, a good thing. But the high stock density grazing or the adaptive grazing we're doing, what we're doing essentially is we're mimicking nature. Anything that we do on the farm, you know, what would mother nature do or how can we make our livestock um, do it? The soil nutrient recycling, that is not mud, that is not pugging, that is even manure distribution upon the snow. We want to, we don't want to have all our, all our nutrients concentrated in one location in the field. We want to evenly uh, distribute them as, as much as possible. That's the reason we rotate twice a day through the winter time. We want our snow to look brown whenever the cows are done grazing. Uh, many of you may know this gentleman, his name's Tim A. Elders. He's the guy that pushed me into what I'm doing, or he planted the seeds, and he was uh, my grazing specialist with the NRCS. He's retired now, but uh, he's helped a lot of folks uh, get on the right track. This here is a field day that we did on the farm. You can see all those flags. We did a demonstration of what 800,000 pounds of animal unit to the acre would look like. We put my cow herd on a tenth of an acre for two hours. We had 500 flags. We stuck 
500 flags and we could have easily stuck another 200 more. We were marking the manure and the urine spots in the field. So in a, as little as two hours, we had a very, very good uh, nutrient cycling. We want that distributed across that field. A lot of times if we're moving our cows like every three days or something like that, when we come back through, we see these green spots in the field and those green spots are from wherever the manure or the urine is. And they're far and few between. We want to get that distributed as evenly as possible. And that will help your plants grow back quicker. And in this field, we had, we split this field down and then we did, I believe it was 400,000 and then we did 200,000. This demonstration, you could see just by doing this once at 800,000 pounds for a two hour period, you could see the difference on how the nutrients recycled for two years. It was totally amazing. This is what 300,000 pounds stock density looks like. Whenever you do the higher stock density grazing, they, they compete for forages. Whenever they compete for forages, there's less, um, there is less forage selection for the cows. Um, they'll actually go out there and compete and they'll eat things that you typically wouldn't think that they would eat or they normally wouldn't eat. The, this picture here, it's kind of hard to see. Those cows are lined up. They're not standing up against the fence. They're 42 abreast working across that field all in unison. And they're competing for the forages. And here, this one, here's a picture here. There's 21 cows working across that field. That The reason those grasses are so short is that field is just about being done grazed and that was uh, early spring. We've done a lot of forage sampling over the years. Uh, you know, the asters, you know, we think of asters as being a weed, um, you know, 24 and a half percent crude protein, goldenrod, 19 and a half, 19, almost 20 percent, shallow, shallow sedge, 17 and a half. You look up on the, on the internet, look up deer tongue and velvet grass, they're going to tell you is very, very poor quality forage and your livestock aren't going to eat it. Well, I proved, proved them wrong. And you know, that's why we need to do testing on our farm on our own. But, you know, velvet grass, 32.8, that is way too hot a forage for any cow as far as I'm concerned. We need to put some roughage with that. That's going to uh, go through those cows at a very, very fast rate and they're not going to be able to absorb the nutrients. But say we have our, our velvet grass, that's, you know, in May, that's in the spring of the year. If we left, uh, if we left some stockpile behind, the cows graze that velvet grass with that stockpile, they would balance the ration out and everything's good to go. Cup plant. This is a native plant. Um, I have done a lot of research on it. I've done some testing with the cup plant and the cup plant in this stage of growth here, it tests better than alfalfa, first cut in alfalfa hay and shell corn put together. One of the greatest things with the cup plant is right in here in this cup, it holds water. There's two leaves adjacent and there's, there's a cup. It holds water. It catches all the rain, rain water. Well, these little guys here, they actually come in and they drink that water in the morning. They don't leave my farm. My, my beneficial birds, my cow bird, well, the cow birds aren't beneficial. They're actually a predatory bird and I don't want them on my farm. Um, but I want tree swallows and bluebirds and, you know, I want them to stay on the farm. I don't want them to have to leave the farm to get water. So I'm making a water source for our birds to stay and they can continue to work at reducing the insects. We do not use anything um, to control flies every once in a while. I make up a, an herbal fly spray. It's nothing. It's just a few herbs. But it's this plant is extremely palatable for the livestock. Um, it's usually what the, that's a mature bull in there. He actually, they'll go in and they'll take those plants out from the get-go. Wild bergamot. Before we leave the, um, 
some of the different plants and the research you've done on them, what sure. lab did you send these samples to? They went to uh, AgriKing laboratories. Um, and the reason being for that is, is they, I purchase um, selenium and a vitamin pack from them and they do my testing for free. So, you know, those samples usually cost about $30, $35 a piece. I can do as many samples throughout the year and it doesn't cost me a cent. So they go to uh, Agar King Laboratories and our wild bergamot. The livestock utilize it a little bit, but for the most part, they don't. I have that in there for our beneficial insects. Um, you know, it brings insects in and predatory insects that actually help control our fly populations. You know, we're looking at a, um, when I look at my farm, I look at it as its own little ecosystem. That there's a hummingbird moth. We have dozens and dozens of those on the farm. I didn't see a hummingbird moth on the farm until approximately three years ago. We have tons of them now. Um, this next field I'm going to show you, our farm is very diverse. We have, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90 permanent or perennial plants planted on the farm. And this year we don't have any annuals. We didn't plant any cover crops or any annuals whatsoever. But this here is a mix that in this next field. And this field here is pretty, pretty amazing field. And if I could only put one, one mix on the whole farm, this would be it. Our first graze through this field, we took approximately two tons of dry matter. This here's cup plant. There's, uh, you can see some of the, there's Timothy there. There's some Virginia wild rye, but usually the first, first graze through it's, it's our cool season plants. And then we'll go, go into our second graze. There's four and a half, to, what four and a half tons of dry matter looks like. Here's me standing in that field, okay? Now keep in mind, this field has never been lined or fertilized. Oh, there's the third grace. Here's one of my border collies. He's standing in there. You can see how the diversity has changed and having the different plants. Um, you know, some of your plants grow better in the cool season. Some grow better in the warm season. You know, so we're actually covering a, a greater, and there's all three fields lined up together, nine and a half tons of total dry matter yield. And we actually went out and clipped and weighed this. So that is fairly accurate. It wasn't a guesstimate. Um, so nine and a half tons, you know, that's, that's a lot. You know, whenever I look at the web soil survey and they say for my soil type, I should only be able to pr produce three tons of dry matter yield under very well managed fertile soils. But if you look at my soil tests, it, tell me, it tells me I'm deficient in almost all my fields. So what's the best way for someone to learn more about the kinds of plants that you have in your pasture? Um, there's a lot of good resources out there um, to find a lot of them. You go to the university websites or the extension websites. They give a Penn State has uh, some good information out there on some of the native plants. I like the native plants because they're already adapted to our soils. We don't have to put a lot of amendments to them. You know, take take for instance alfalfa. I have alfalfa growing on the farm, but you know, to have alfalfa productive, we need a pH of seven zero and it needs to be, you know, have a lot of potassium and, and phosphorus in order for it to grow correctly. And you're still not going to get, you're going to be really hard to get nine and a half tons of uh, dry matter yield. And if you, if you start following me on either Facebook or um, YouTube, I have some good YouTube videos on some of the native plants that we have growing on the farm and some of the plant species. And I actually on Facebook, whenever I see a new species on the farm, I'll target that species and talk a little bit about it. So I also give that, that uh, information, but your universities are probably some of your best places to look. Now, keep in mind, if you're doing native plants, a lot of the research that's done is done for conservation purposes. 
not for grazing purposes. Um, say like if we're establishing eastern gamma grass, um, you know, most generally they'll tell you you need a seeding rate of eight pounds to the acre. I like to plant at about 16 and 20 pounds to the acre. So you got to keep that in mind whenever you're reading this, the research. This here is just a, a transect that we did in that field and the plant species. You know, most of it was Virginia wild rye. And, you know, we have, we have a ton of different species. We did a hundred, we did uh, 200 foot transects, 300 per, 100 foot transects. And this here's the averages that come up, come up with. Actually, there's a lot of big blue stem in there. Um, you can't really see it in this because it's early in the season yet and it's the big blue stem wasn't at its um, but you can see all the pollinators in there a lot of pollinators a lot of cup plant it gives the birds a lot of places to be our beneficial insects this field is always a foot tall our first thing in the spring these here are some of the custom heifers that we grazed one year we put them out in um, it would have been about the first of May and you can see how tall that grass is already. In my area, it's, it's orchard grass is probably the second tallest grass, but this here is a good foot taller than any of the orchard grass on the farm. We also utilize our warm season grasses as um, winter stockpile, but they cannot solely live on this. At least my cow herd can't yet. I'm working at trying to get them to be efficient. You know, the, the switch grass in here will test probably around four and a half percent crude protein. Uh, some of the other stuff, the big blue stem will test down at two, two percent crude protein. You're gonna say, well, you're gonna starve your cows. If we take and have a field, let's, oh, let me get my pencil out of here say we stockpile this field over here and it's really high quality stuff and it's not uncommon to have a stockpile with a crude protein of 20 percent in the winter time if we do it correctly and have the right species in it if we move the cows in here for a day and then move them over here for a day back here for a day you know it sounds hard but you know it doesn't take that much to move cows once they learn how to do it and I guess more than anything it's a learning process for the farmer to learn how to to be able to do it without causing a lot of chaos but by doing that the cows it balances their ration out and the cows can utilize this forage the higher protein actually helps them digest this poor quality forage excellent Russ, we had another question come in. Um, sure. How often do you soil test? Um, I use a soil test every year. And quite frankly, I'm not applying fertilizer. The only fertilizer that I would be applying is if I capture any uh, manure throughout the winter and we'll put it out onto the fields that need it. And actually, we soil, to, to be straightforward, I, I soil test every three years because I have to. Mm -hmm. Okay, because whenever we apply the manure that we have collected onto the farm or that we have collected, it only covers maybe five to 10 acres. It doesn't cover very much of the farm at all. And I'm not gonna put it where the soil test says I need it. I'm gonna put it where the plants tell me it needs to be. Excellent. And another question as far as the plants and the different forages. Mm -hmm. um, have you done any, is there any research on if that would impact the quality of milk if somebody is grazing a dairy herd? Um, if you're graze, grazing a dairy herd, um, you're not going to, you're going to graze differently from me because you have a different class of livestock and they need a little bit better quality forages. Um, you know, you're not going to be, this is big blue stem Indian grass and switchgrass. You're not going to have your dairy cattle in here. You're probably going to be on a shorter uh, rest period than what I am. I would say probably from the forage sampling that I've done, you're probably going to be on a 60 to a 70 day um, rotation would probably be the best that you'd have to take the forage samples. So, you know, your dairy is going to be grazed a lot differently from the gestational beef cows. Um, 
but as far as plant quality, I have not tested any plants that would not uh, be suitable at one point or another for lactating animals. Great, thank you. Great questions, everyone. Yes, please keep them coming. This, you know, this here's for this. I'm doing this for you guys. I want to try and help you out, make your farm more profitable. So don't be afraid to ask questions. We're all friends here. Uh, the bit this here's a bit this here's the big blue stem switchgrass Indian grass field. I always I set almost 100% of my fence off the buggy. I used to do it all on foot. There's nothing wrong with doing it on foot. Um, it just takes a little bit longer for me setting fence. I'd rather take two minutes and set a 300 foot run of fence and spend 10 minutes looking at my cows versus taking 10 minutes setting a 300 foot run and taking two, pen, two minutes and look at the cows. So, you know, I guess we're just time swapping. There's, uh, believe it or not, in this, you can see these little black spots in here. Those are actually cows. There's actually, uh, I believe in this field here, there's 80 animal units in this, in this paddock that they're in right here. This here was in July, uh, June of 2017. That's uh, a native warm season stand of grasses that we have. We've actually interceded them now. They have bergamot cup plant, uh, tick tree foil, plains coreopsis. To me, the just having those three grasses is a monoculture and mono, monocultures drive me crazy uh, because monocultures, if we look at the difference between monocultures and polycultures, the polycultures are going to be more resilient. We need resilience and Right now, with the dry period that we have, we need that resilience to stand out and shine. And it is actually shining on my farm. We, we're going to look at that in a little bit. Here's, here's a, a well-known weed, an aster. Deer tongue. I talked about the asters and the deer tongue a little bit. But the deer tongue, the great thing with deer tongue, it can live and do well on a pH of 3.8. That's extremely low. And so, you know, our farms that uh, need to be, have lime or fertilizer, you know, this plant here is already adapted to our soils. And you can see this mule here, whenever I'm out riding her, she finds a patch of deer tongue. She's gonna try and get every little bite of deer tongue that she can. There's more of the New England aster. Another thing that was really unique about the uh, New England aster whenever I tested, it's actually high in zinc. And you'll find a lot of these uh, so-called weeds are high of in something or another, you know, whether it's zinc, magnesium, calcium, uh, sulfur, you know, they're, each one of them seems to be high in a certain part. Now this plant, this uh, video here is a little bit catchy. Um, so forgive me, I don't know why it didn't record correctly. It's not even gonna show here. There we go. It's, it's got a little catchy, but that there's a patch of Canadian thistle that I have on the farm, had on the farm. And we were actually able to kill that Canadian thistle without clipping, just grazing. See the cows that they grazed that. This is what it looked like after they get done grazing. We left a lot of cover on the soil and then this here's a video that I, I posted on Facebook. So I'm gonna leave the words go on this and let, let you watch this. Um,
Okay. But, you know, you can control your weeds. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, how can you do it with your livestock? And for me, you know, I could have come out and 2,4-D that field or put some sort of herbicide on it to kill those Canadian thistles. Um, I could have clipped those pastures, but I'd rather, I chose to utilize the forages because the cows you could see in the higher stock density grazing. Um, they readily ate those Canadian thistles and we have those Canadian thistles under control now. Russ, we have a question. Sure. Uh, it looks like you primarily graze Angus or Angus genetics. Is that for marketing purposes or do you find that they do better on this system? Um, whenever I first started into the beef cattle, I researched and I researched and I researched. And I wanted the cow or the animal with the most marketing ability. So my first choice on selling livestock is to sell breeding stock. Second choice is sell freezer beef. Third choice is to sell feeders off the farm for other people to grow out. And then if I get a call animal, I'm not going to sell somebody a, uh, a call animal for beef or uh, breeding genetics. I want to be able to send it to the sale barn. I'm going to still probably lose money, but at least I'm not going to lose my butt. Um, so, you know, ultimately what I'd like to have is, you know, a mixed herd. I like all cows. It doesn't matter to me, you know, Texas Longhorns, Scottish Highland, uh, Herefords, it doesn't matter. But the reason that I have the black cows is just for marketing purposes only. Um, and to be quite honest with you, uh, whenever I first, whenever I first started doing this, I don't have the same cow herd today as what I did then. The cow herd that I had then could not, would actually starve to death in my system today than what it was when it was in 2009. They need, a, they were bigger framed animals. They needed a lot more uh, inputs and it was a lot costlier to, to maintain those animals. But uh, we have, we have really good grass genetics now. We, we've called the ones out that couldn't make it and uh, we were, we're actually sending uh, cattle all over the Eastern seaboard now. So, and we do not do any advertising whatsoever as far as selling our breeding stock. Now we do occasionally advertise that we have some freezer beef uh, occasionally, but for the most part, you know, everything's word of mouth and somebody comes and gets livestock from me, they're going to be happy with them. They're going to tell a friend and their friend's going to come buy uh, animals from me. Okay, milkweeds. Milkweed's a toxic plant. Um, a lot of animals won't uh, graze it as long as it's diluted into their rations by 10% or less. You know, we don't have a problem with that. You know, our monarch butterfly, we owe it to the monarch butterfly to fence those, uh, those milkweed paddocks out as much as possible. So, um, you know, it's not, not hard to fence you know, throw a temporary fence, five minutes maybe, you know. But if we don't get those fenced out, this is what the milkweed look like after whenever we're in a high stock density grazing setup. Um, you know, the cows, they'll come in, they strip those leaves, they strip the seed pods, they'll eat half the stock. I mean, they really, they really work the milkweed over. And I contribute that to there being a, a nutrient in that milkweed. I've not tested milkweed, um, but I, I contribute that to there being a nutrient in there that they may be a little bit deficient in that they're trying to get. If you haven't figured out by now, you know, I try to do bio, a lot of biodiversity on the farm. You know, I try to think of, you know, our microbes, our insects, our birds, and over here, we can't see it because of the chat or the video pod, our rodents. You know, we have thousands and thousands of rodents that live in the farm. Um, I don't normally feed the collies during the winter time. They catch 10, 15 mice a day and eat them. But, you know, we have to have all these other animals and our healthy plants before we can have our livestock. 
And you can see that's a mature bull. We had snow the night before it's laying on his neck. Cows, a lot of times, whenever there's snow on the ground and they're out there, um, that snow will lay on their backs for days at a time. Here's some of the microbes off of our farm. I have not been able to identify them and I've asked folks to identify them for me, but they have not been able to, either they, they don't know or they just haven't had time to look at them. You know, and, and we look at our, our partnerships within our plants, uh, where we've learned that, you know, plants can share nutrients, you know, as long with, even with the, the microbes, you know, our, our fung, fungi and, and different things, you know, we have those partnerships you know, maybe this plant here can't reach down to calcium, but this plant here can get calcium, but it needs uh, zinc, and this plant here has an access to zinc. You know, this would be a, a, an example of a partnership. But we gotta be careful in this system. You know, we can, we can upset the balance pretty quickly. Um, you know, if we overgraze it, we, you know, there's not enough food for our, our microbes, and they may, uh, starve or go into uh, shutdown mode, you know, and we need to think about the soil nutrient recycling. And one thing that I didn't touch on yet, um, we don't actually let our cows go back to shade during the summertime. Uh, if they need shade, I'll actually physically put them into shade. Uh, normally, they only need shade. I've This summer, it's been pretty hot here. This summer here, we've actually only physically taken them back to shade a couple times. Uh, one time was because we had a calf born, uh, an unexpected calf born the end of July. Um, and calves cannot control their body temperature for the four, first four days of life. And they heat stress and can possibly die relatively quickly. So you know, we need to get shade if we have any babies. So our calving season is very, very crucial. We calve from the third week in April to the third week in June. Um, those, that is my calving season. That seems to be what works the best for us. We'll talk a little about winter and winter stockpile. This right now is when we should be uh, stockpiling forages for winter, but a lot of folks, they don't have the pastures to stockpile. And quite frankly, they're not growing as well as they should because of the droughts. Um, you know, so we need to build that, that drought resilience into our soils. Um, this here's one continuous plant. This is what stockpile looks like, but you can see how it's all laying flat onto the ground. But you can see how, you know, I, I believe that was 42 inches tall or something, the leaves of the ribbons of grass, as I like to call it. And, you know, ideal winter grazing for us is 10 degrees and 24 inches of snow. You know, your cows can go through, I've grazed through up to three feet of snow with the cattle. Uh, they don't have any problem. It's very, very easy for them. This here was New Year's Day a couple of years ago. Um, stockpile grasses. You can see how long, you know, the cow's hoof, you know, what's a cow's hoof? Three, four inches tall. That's all laying flat on the ground. But here in a second, you'll see this calf here. Now, this calf here. Look at this mouthful of grass this calf has. You know, she's... And that would have been the calf from the, you know, the previous season. You can see how well filled out those calves. Those calves all look good. They're out there with their mamas yet. They're out there grazing. So there's nothing better than the sound of ripping grass on a cow. It's kind of soothing to just go out there and listen to those cows make a living. Now we're strip grazing this field because of water and water temperature. And we're gonna pan around this field. And one of the interesting things are we're not really froze down here. You can see here's the graze line. We pulled that fence out. My collie dogs are out hunting for mice. And there's like three paddocks across here. And our watering point is right there. But one of the most interesting things of this whole deal is we're not froze up. And we've had four inches of rain from where this tub is to where were the cows is at. And we did no damage to that field or very little damage. There was no pugging. 
one of the reasons for that is those those plants, let me see if I can come back. Yeah. Those plants, our root systems, as we just learned today, our root systems are indicative to what's above ground to what's below ground. We have massive root systems and we need to think of those root systems as geotextile fabric. So that geotextile fabric is actually keeping those livestock up out of the mud. And we're keeping them moving too. They have good fresh grass in front of them. If we, okay, you can see here, I didn't graze. There's a lot left behind here. There's a lot of mud on top of that grass. And those cows, if I weren't, was to not move them, they would actually start traveling this field looking for something to eat. And we're gonna get a lot more traffic across that field, which is gonna cause pugging and compaction. So, you know, don't be afraid to waste a little, you know, we'll get that next spring whenever the grass is lush and green and we need to, um, whenever we need to, uh, put a little bit of roughage with our, our lush grasses. So here, this is not a really good example, but you can watch, see how she pushes right through that snow? That snow is nothing to her. You know, and even when it's three feet deep, you know, when it's, their bellies are rubbing the ground or, you know, the snow's up waist high, it's not a problem for those thousand pound animals to reach down through that grass. And now don't expect your cows to reach through three feet of snow and there's only 12 inches of grass there. They need to have something down there for them to, to, to reach for. So Russ, we have a question. Sure. As far as your stockpiled pastures, when do you start letting them grow? And then when do you generally graze them? Well, first off, I graze them whenever I need them because we're out grazing uh, this year. I don't know if we're gonna make the 350 day mark this year, which um, with the reduced in the, the drought that we had, we're gonna be down probably around, oh, I would say around 315 to 320 grazing days. So our cows is out there all the time. So actually, you know, we graze them as we come to them, as the fields need to be grazed to answer that question. And we actually have fields, oh, I hear Titus's cows. Um, <laughs> uh, we actually have fields that, that are gonna come around to where they have 365 days of rest. We haven't even, we've grazed, we have about 35 acres that we haven't grazed yet this year. So, you know, you stockpile them whenever you can and, you know, whenever it's possible. But most generally, um, the statistics and the research shows that you probably should start stockpiling approximately 60 days prior to graze. Um, in my mind, if we're gonna make a cow go through three feet of snow, she's not gonna go through three feet of snow for 60 days worth of grass. Um, you need more like uh, 90 to 100 days of stockpile gr uh, growth. So, you know, if you're going to graze in December or early spring, you know, it's okay for that 60 day growth, but, you know, she needs to have something to, to go through that snow to get. Okay, I've, I've shown that we've, we've freed a ton of time up on the farm. Um, that doesn't mean I sit around the in the house and eat Twinkies and watch soap operas all day. I, I still, uh, I'm still busy. I, I, I'm busy because I choose to be busy. It's not because I have to be busy. Okay, if that makes any sense to you. So, um, you know, the freed up time, it makes me wanna try and make things more streamlined, make things more efficient, faster, quicker, better, um, make things more productive. So here's one of the innovations that I've come up with. The research for this, um, the portable windbreaks is from the government of Saskatchewan, Canada. There, that is a very good research source as well, as far as grasses, the question was asked, uh, resources for grasses, but they, they have a ton of information. Um, and the research for my portable windbreaks, uh, I keep the portable windbreak breaks out with the cows. My fields are relatively open. Um, so I need to reduce the energy needs from the wind. Now my cows could probably, you know, we have cows can live out there now without the windbreaks, but um, 
why don't we reduce the energy needs on them if we need to the, you know i quit making hay so there's all my hay wagons um i wasn't going to give them away like folks wanted them the, the gears was all pretty rough but you know hey these work great um you know i can move them once a day i i actually i move those with my buggy until the snow gets to be about 18 inches deep and then i have to go out with a tractor but i'll move the front two and then there's three more i'll move they're actually all hooked together so i would have pulled that in with the tractor but for the most part um i'll pull two ahead with the buggy and then i'll come back and get the other three and pull them ahead it takes 10 minutes a day and we leapfrog from paddock to or from hydrant to hydrant whenever uh we're in that that state and we need about approximately 30 percent porosity um if we didn't have these slats or have these openings and these are solid walls the wind would just blow them over 10 mile an hour wind would just flip them things over like like crazy so you know that's one of the innovations that we've done uh and now I, this is something that I've been working on for a really long time because to me, flipping a 300 gallon stock tank over and keeping it with the cows is not attractive. Um, so this here is just a mortar mixing tub filled with 10 gallons of water. Um, and then we, with a high flow valve with an eight gallon per minute uh, flow rate. And this here will, um, uh, I've watered 110 animal units out of this tank. This here's the 55 gallon water tank, the high flow valve. You can see I have the, the um, hydrant covered up. Uh, it's nine degrees out. It has what they call a, uh, a frost pro in it. It's just a leaky valve that just keeps on leaking, keeps it from freezing up. And then this here is my portable frost-free water tub that I made out of a 55 gallon drum and bubble wrap. That's just a 55 gallon drum wrapped in bubble wrap and then a piece of foam insulation on the top and the bottom. Uh, we've tested this down to 17 degrees below zero without any heat in it. And what makes this successful is right before the valve, I put this, this coupling in there and then there's a, a 64th inch drill bit hole drilled into that and then it just flows water all the time. Um, and we've never froze a hydrant up yet. But this here is the best water tank setup that I've come up with yet. Whenever the water is, or whenever the soils are not froze down, I use uh, belting, rubber belting with two handles on it. You know, if you're going to make mud in the paddock, it's going to be around the water tub. And then this here's uh, that water tub that's wrapped in bubble wrap with uh, my new best valve. It's a brass valve. And then I have a, there's a, a needle valve, that brass valve will allow you to drill a hole and tap a needle valve into it. And I'm gonna sh go check on something real quick. I'm gonna show this video to you.
Okay, can you still hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Russ. Okay. We couldn't hear um, the uh, the audio with the video. We weren't sure if oh, you were... I wonder, wonder what yeah. happened there. Maybe just explain to us what the features are in this system. Okay, um, we'll go back through here. I must have did something. Let me see here. The features in this system um, is a really cheap valve. This valve is um, a $17 valve. You can get it on uh, Amazon compared to that Job valve, which is I think running around 90 bucks now. This is a high flow valve. It's brass, it has three moving parts, I believe. So it, it doesn't have a lot to go wrong with it. Um, and as you could see in the video here, you could see how easy it is and how portable it is. Um, to, to, flip, to flip that over, you know, and dump it and move it to our next paddock. And then in all my tubs, including the Rubbermaid tub, I'll put some sort of a bracing. Most of the bracing that I use is just uh, a four inch circle cut with a hole saw out of a, a 55 gallon drum. I love to use that material. It works great for making patches and fixes and whatnot. I don't use any silicone in behind anything anymore. You can see it leaks there a little bit, but you know, it's just very, very minimal. And then I always put a cage in around all my valves of some sorts. Um, that cage is very, very important uh, because if you have a cow or a calf, something step on that valve. And another thing, those big heavy noses of those cows, they can really mess a valve up in a hurry. So, um, you know, I recommend cage and everything. We're getting pretty well to the end of the the presentation here, you know, and, and just applying some of those principles, we can extend the grazing season, you know, and every day you're out there grazing, for me, it's 150 days or $150 less that I have to, to buy hay. Um, whether I buy hay or I make it, it's $150 less. You're going to increase your soil structure, which you're going to have a better water holding capacity. And as I discussed on uh, the first presentation that we did, um, it takes approximately, there's a, a study that came out of the University of Georgia, it takes approximately 240,000 gallons of water to produce one ton of dry matter in fescue. So that's, you need to be able to hold as much water as possible. You know, and even to make your, your farm drought resistant, um, you know, that's extremely important. Weed control, we don't want to take too much. We don't want to overgraze because we overgraze and daylight that soil. As soon as that soil, you have uh, uh, the sunlight hits the surface of that soil, it, it triggers a lot of the seeds in our seed bank to start germinating. We want to break those insect, break the insect and parasite cycles, you know, try to keep our livestock. We need to sequester as many soil nutrients as possible. Uh, you know, we don't want to have that rainwater runoff off the farm, taking all our nutrients with it. You know, I don't share my soil and I don't want to share my soil nutrients with the guy down in, Miss, down, down in Mississippi there someplace. So, you know, we want to keep all that, you know, our phosphorus, our potassium, you know, everything on the farm as much as possible. And, you know, for me, you know, you can be profitable and farm, you know, you hear it so many times, you can't make money farming, you know, if you can't make money farming, you should probably try something else, you know, try to do it a different way. Um, you know, you're going to have a higher financial gain. And for me, you know, I want to free as much time up as possible, you know, I could be out there plowing and planting and harvesting and you know, that's to me, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. I, I, I enjoy it for a very short period of time, but I, I would much rather build water tanks and fence jumpers and seed spinners and, and stuff for all my buggy to make things more efficient. And I showed this slide, um, you know, essentially all life depends on soil. And, 
you know, let's add to that a little bit. You know, as livestock grazers, you can build soil to make your farm more profitable. This here's my contact information. You know, you have any questions, shoot me an email. Um, you can look me up on Facebook, friend me on Facebook. Uh, uh, as long as you don't look too uh, uh, spamish, I'll, uh, I'll friend you back. But uh, you know how Facebook works. Uh, but I do post a lot of uh, short videos on Facebook. I do do YouTube. I think I got pretty close to 50 YouTube videos now. I haven't posted any for a month or so because I've been I've been busy with other things. But we'll get back at it here in the fall and and get you know get some more videos out there. If there's something that or a specific video that you might be interested in, you know, shoot me an email and say, hey, I want to learn how to fence. Hey, I want to, you know, how do you set that corner? How you know? And I'll see if I can't get a video at some point for you. So. Do we have any questions, Selena? Yes, we do. Awesome. So the first one, if you let your pasture rest for a hundred days, mm -hmm. I think this is going back to the stockpiling. Sure. It would be quite mature. The feed quality would be low. Why do you not shorten the return period a bit and get better quality? Okay. Um, my cattle have been developed to be able to utilize those rougher forages. Um, I don't need the better quality for the cattle that I have. Now, if, if it was the cattle that I had in 2009, I would have to shorten it, that uh, window up a little bit and give them a bet, little better quality. But I've been working, and I like to call them work the cows. I like to feed them the lowest plane of nutrition possible. And then at the end of the year, I call, every year I call anywhere from 10 to 15% of the cow herd. They're gone. Um, and, and in doing so, it's made it for a, a lot more efficient animal. But one of the things that I'd like to point out about that 100 day rest period, um, and this, I'm going to use an example as if we were going back to making hay, you know, you hear the story, well, you know, you make first cut in hay and then it gets really wet and you can't get that first cut in hay. So you're going to make the first and second cut hay together. Um, actually, the longer that goes, you know, say at the say at the 70 to 90 day period, that forage may be pretty rough and pretty nasty, but that second crop is actually starting to grow up through that and it's actually increasing the, the quality in that field. So, um, you know, if it's rested a little bit longer, the quality I found goes, starts, starts increasing. It's like if you know, you can make that rough first cut in hay, or you can make your first and second cut in hay, and it's a little better quality than that rough first cut in hay. Okay, next Great. question. It says, I'm sure your herd is evolving along with your goals, but do you have a target culling percentage, or what is the average age of your brood cows? Um. Yes, I try to call 10 to 15% of the herd every year. Um, that's just something that I do. And I can see those numbers actually decreasing as I see the cows uh, more becoming more efficient animals. Um, and my cow herd is actually relatively young because I do have been doing a calling, um, you know, in 20 years, I expect the, the, the the age, the average age, age of the cows to be a lot higher because we're actually calling those uh, higher input animals out of the herd right now. And I would say our average age in the cow herd right now is about seven and a half to eight years. Great. Do we have other questions? I There's a lot of chats, Russ, just, you know, thanking you for all this information, um, for joining us today and sharing so much. Yes, please, uh, you know, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. If uh, we get off here and uh, you think of a question, write my email down. Write my email down, shoot me an email, uh, message me on Facebook. Um, Probably actually messaging me on Facebook is probably the, the quicker, easier way of doing it. So um, 
you know. Great. Well, we had a couple questions come in. Okay. Do you have a closed herd or do you bring other animals into the operation? Uh, occasionally I'll bring a bull in here and there, but uh, for the most part, I have not bought any cattle, any female cattle for since 2011. So for the most part, and I've only bought one herd bull in the last six years, I believe it is. Um, so for the most part, the, the herd is pretty well closed. Excellent. Another question. Based on the efficiency demonstrated, do you retain many heifers? I retain all my heifers. Um, I re retain them. I'll get them out to uh, breeding age. I'll breed them. And the ones that don't get bred, they're within uh, the first coming breeding season. You know, we'll breed them at uh, a yearlings and if they don't breed those actually will go to freezer beef and uh, we won't uh, keep them I won't keep them and breed them and sell them as three-year-old bred heifers um, I want fertile animals and I want to sell fertile animals uh, so and then if we have any extras we'll you know we have to see where we're at at any given year we sell we'll sell bred heifers as well so that's what we do with our heifers. Excellent. Uh, we had a question about finding you on Facebook. I believe that if you search Russ Wilson cattle, uh, you are the first person to come up. Okay. I can, um, you, you can find me at Wilson Land and Cattle Company as well. Okay. I, have a, I have a farm page as well, Wilson Land Cattle Company. Okay. And you can find me on YouTube. Uh, I believe it's youtube.com backslash capital R Russ, you know, capital R U S S capital W uh, I L S O N. Excellent. And I just, I just did a quick search. Russ Wilson cattle does work. Um, okay. If you just do Russ Wilson, you get a football player. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a famous quarterback that, uh, uh, I'm in competition with, but I don't think he knows anything about grass. <laughs> no, that's great. I really encourage everybody to check yeah. out. Um, Russ has, you said 50 videos. I just saw how many different topics and um, I think they're really incredible. Yeah. And I, I encourage, you know, you know, what's your interests? Um, you know, I encourage people to, to reach out to me. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather do a video that, uh, people would want to see versus the video that I think people should see. Um, you know, I think it's more beneficial that way. And another thing that I wanted to reach out to or, or let folks know here, um, I'm working on, I'm working with Headwaters up in uh, Potter County. We're going to be doing some videos and those are going to be made available. We're going to do a virtual pasture walk. And also I'm working with, uh, Regenerative Agriculture Summit in Greenville, Tennessee. I'll be going down there and in the end of September. We're going to be doing uh, a lot of video work and we're going to have some NRCS specialists and stuff. We're going to video that. So those videos will be available as well. Um, so that, you know, that, that will help folks out as well. Um, and another thing, I'm going to also be working with Selena. Uh, we discussed it briefly, but um, I've been looking for someone to help me uh, go through all my old presentations. I'm going to present all my old presentations on Zoom and we're going to record them and make them available to you. Yeah, so we have everyone's email address. We can um, send you the link to today's meeting and uh, that will kind of help open up uh, some communication. I'll copy Russ on that email so you can get in touch with him directly as well to get just all of these different resources. And it might be a little overwhelming at first, but just, uh, you know, take, take each, um, each video, take a little piece from it and uh, excited to see where everybody ends up. Yeah, yeah, I encourage everybody to give it a try. You know, don't give up, you can do it. Um, you're just applying principles. I don't expect anyone to do 
uh, things exactly the way I do it, but you know, for the most part, you can make your farm a lot more environmental friendly. You can make it more profitable and it can uh, consume a lot less time, you know, give time to take the kids fishing or your grandkids fishing and, you know, enjoy life a little bit. Excellent. Thanks so much, Russ. I think sure. that's it for the questions. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. Yeah, thank you.